we're going to talk about bows. Now, first of all, I'd like to explain why I've kind of disappeared. It's been a rather kind of a rotten two weeks, a crummy two weeks. If you've watched my videos over time, you, you realize that, that I had some bow cats, three very special bow cats. And during my single years, you know, they were like in the winter, my only companion. Sometimes I'd go a week or two without seeing other people. Um, one died, BK, Big Kitty, died, what was it, like a, a year and a half ago. Then, then Mittens went last spring, and then number three just succumbed yesterday with a, a bout cancer, kidney disease, whatever, but she was sick two weeks ago, and, and now Tiki is no longer. And, uh, yep, that's, that's the way it is. Life goes on, but, um, you know, it's tough. You have your, your cherished family pets, whether it's a dog or a, a cat or a, a bird or something. There's a special bond between people and animal life. You know, it's, it's tough. And in some respects, you know, it's not only the loss of a, a loved family pet, but um, my kids brought these little creatures home, you know? So it also represents a part of my life. Kids still in the house, you know? Christmases with the kids and all this other stuff, and it is just like closing a door. Now we look ahead. Interesting note, last night, uh, a contractor, a builder, a really nice guy, David, not going to tell us last night, even though I could. I mean, this guy does great work, and he's just a sweetheart of a guy and bought a, a bow for me a while back for his son-in-law. And it's another case of I make these bows, and they don't get used because it's hanging up in his man cave, you know, in a place of honor, along with a set of arrows that G at Warpath Archery made for him. But I get this text. John, I was at a job site, and there's a water feature, and there's this frog sitting in the stream. You know, water feature, it's like pond and little stream and stuff. Uh, gravel bottom, so this poor frog is sitting in the water, and nowhere to go except just sit there and wait to freeze to death. And so I uh, bring him by. You know, I'll chop a hole in the pond and uh, release the frog into a nice pond with a muddy bottom. Well, this morning, of course, things don't go as planned. It's a challenge. I lost a cat. I'm not going to lose a frog. And, you know, it is what it is. And so I go there, chop the hole, take the frog, get him accustomed to the cold water, scooping it into the bucket, slide him in there, and whoom, like a bobber. Um, for some reason, he's full of air. His, his uh, swim bladder didn't release the air. So now I'm going to set up an aquarium and nurse this frog back to health before I release him. You know, and I don't see any irony. I'm going to talk about bows, bows for hunting. You know, if, and I'm not going to claim that I see any difference to that. I'm going to be kind. I'm going to show mercy to this frog. But yet I'm going to sell bows so people can knock down deer. Hunting, eating meat, that's the game. That's the way the world works. But it doesn't mean that we can't have empathy for our fellow creatures. Because when it comes down to it, we're not hunting because we enjoy killing creatures. It's the way the world works. It's the way the world works ever since we first stepped foot on this earth. You know, I don't see any any conflict in there, any irony. Who is it? 233? Oh, probably telemarketer. Don't recognize the number. But let's talk about bows. It seems like I've had a rather negative run of luck lately, but I had good luck. Never before have I gone into Home Depot, or Despot as I call it, even though I like the people that work at Home Depot. They seem to know what they're doing walk into the that wonderful aisle full of wood red oak it's good reliable bow wood and whoever operates the kilns that is connected with the sales of the wood at home depot does a good job because if they're too harsh with their kiln protocol they can case harden the wood and make it just unusable um, but home depot does a pretty good job of picking out who sells lumber but lest i regrets went there and it was like the angels were singing from up high there was a beautiful piece of wood about the length, and I'm not going to have Home Depot cut eight inches off so I can save eight, eight inches of money. I'm taking the whole thing. 
the perfect board. And it is a, a wonderment of tree technology. Look at this thing. I'm just going to put it right here. And you can see how it ranges from the grain orientation, from bias ring. I don't know if it's like this or like this, but whatever. Same thing. And then it grades into the center where it's, it's flat sawn. I mean, I could get a nice, uh, say, couple of short horse bows out of the center. Um, one of my talisman, I call it, possibly a paddle bow or a second talisman, and a couple horse bows out of this thing. Growth ring. And I could even go to the trouble, which is not necessary if they're sinew back, of scraping it down to a single growth, growth ring. Look at that. The perfect board. I'm not saying, well, I can work with that grain it is perfectly straight on the other side and plain sawn down the center this is too bad they don't make uh, 10 inch boards they make well yeah this is a 10 10 inch um nine inches so i've got three inches six inches for the pb talisman kind of thing and i've got another three and a half inches which will give me two horse bows down the center for 57 dollars i have four bows in now for the second thing, second thing, uh, Matt, you had some questions about making a short horse bow or this or that or a short paddle bow. This is, uh, what's wonderful about my paddle bow design is I can just shorten it, change the tips around, and you notice this is not a 66 inch paddle bow. Let's measure this first because Matt was curious about dimensions. 53 inches, 53 inches. I've had this for a long time, nice little bow. It's not sinew back, but I might strip the finish off of this and sinew back it. This is really cool. It makes me happy because the dimensions are nice. Now, Matt, um, there, it, people ask me, I need to have the dimensions for a bow. First of all, there are so many permutations, so many variables. The one thing you need to be concerned about is, though, with anything but you, to some extent, Juniper, if you have wide, thin limbs grading into a narrowed center section, and it's not you or Juniper, don't have a bend through the handle. There's something weird that happens. Uh, my mind isn't 100% here. Um, but you have to have a stiff handle bow. That is the key, or else you're gonna have a failure. If you're pushing limits in here, you better believe that if you bend through the handle and it's narrowed and thicker, you're beyond um, the stress points of this thing. So in red oak, you have to have, with a bow like this, not a D bow, not parallel limbs, but very wide and thin, going to a narrow, thick handle, um, you have to have it a stiff handle. Now, as far as that goes, when you tiller them, they create themselves. You get that, that face, it's not a profile, but we'll call it a face shape, face profile. And the tillering does not work, but as long as you're starting with about three quarters of an inch in the handle and then beyond the fades, um, rough it out to a half, event, half an inch, you're, you have not gone beyond that point where it's too thin. Half an inch is a, exactly half an inch, is a good starting point for a bow of this type. And, you know, even a, a horse bow and stuff, half inch. Start with that and then start um, like tillering it down. But that's that. I don't need to say any more. I appreciate the people emailing me and texting me and stuff like that asking, am I okay? Yeah. You know, death is just that part of life. It, it stings a bit, but life goes on. You know, we're all going to meet that fate eventually. Hopefully, we'll have somebody that'll be there by our side, if we so wish, as we were with poor Tiki. Yeah, this is nice. This is nice. Um, that's all. Have a good one. I'm back, part two. We are multifaceted beings. You see that 
that Gibson mandolin up there. I have a Kentucky, a KM250S, made in Japan in the early 80s. If you're a mandolinist, you appreciate the, the value of a Japanese-made Kentucky mandolin. And uh, I, I've been diagnosed with MAS, Mandolin Acquirement Syndrome. So I've been going around looking at the intermanets. What is going to be my next quarry? And I was going back and forth between, oh, a, a Gibson A9, which is a teardrop-shaped thing, but it's Gibson with F-holes, so it's more bluegrassy. No, I want to get kind of a version of that, but a Gibson snakehead, which would have a truss rod. That doesn't have a truss rod. And then it has a different shaped headstock. But then, I like Kentucky, an oval hole Kentucky, so I'll get that deep woody sound, gibson esh Cheating a little bit. Instead of trying to get a great mandolin with F-holes, go with the round hole, the oval hole. Get that deep woody Gibson-y sound in a cheaper instrument. Um, that is all. Oh, except for storing your bow wood. Don't store it outside if it's winter, cold, because it can dry out too much. I'm actually storing it in this music room. I've got a humidifier right here to make my instruments happy. I maintain it at about 50% humidity. It's also good for bow wood. Now I'm done.